All right, church. Could we stand up together? We're going to sing some songs of praise to Jesus.
God, we thank you so much for who you are. And this is our prayer this morning. As we come before you, that you would open our eyes so that we could see you. Because you are the one we need to be looking at and gazing upon and sitting with. And just being aware, God, it sometimes seems so hard. But this morning, as we gather here just for this, for you, God, to sit in your truths, to hear from your word, and to believe uh, what you say. And so, God, I pray that as we uh, hear it, that you would give us what we need to obey it. And that we would find freedom in knowing that you don't need any of it. We don't need to earn any of it. So, God, would you hear the desire of our hearts this morning? We need you. We need to see you. And we ask, God, that you would teach us how to build our life around you so we can see things the way you do. We can love the way you call us to love, and we can reflect you here and bring hope into a world that needs it so much. So even now, God, would you breathe life and hope into us now? We need you. We are broken and weary, and um, we just need you. So God, uh, thank you for always showing up. Thank you for being near, and I thank you in advance for all that you're going to do today. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all this Sunday morning. You can actually go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, welcome to those of you that are joining us online as well. And if you're new here, my name is Gina. So glad that you're joining us on this Sunday morning. And we'd love to get to know you better, see how we could serve you. In the pocket of the seat in front of you, there's a card with a QR code. You can scan that, put in some information, and then we'll follow up with you this week. Also, for everyone here on that card as well, there's some room at the bottom where you can write in a prayer request. And if there's anything that you're going through, anything that someone you care about is going through that you'd like prayer for, please. Please write it on that card, drop it in the giving box on your way out, and we have a, a prayer team that would love to be praying for you. Now, this week at church was a really fun, exciting week. If you don't know, this week we held Hope Kids Camp here, and uh, we've got some pictures to show you. Had over 100 kids here, tons of volunteers and interns, and they had a great time. I mean, there were like water balloons flying everywhere. They were worshiping and singing and opening their Bibles, and uh, honestly, it was just such a great time. This place was filled with joy and uh, wouldn't have happened without all of the volunteers who gave up their days to be here to serve our kids. So would you just thank them with me? We're so grateful for them. Yeah. These are some of our interns on Wacky Wednesday. You can see they really got into it. So it was super fun. Also today, this morning at about 9.30, our middle school students left for their camp. And so they're on the road now. They should get to their location in the next half hour or so. And uh, for some of these students that you see here, this is their first camp experience. Some of them, it's their first time away from home overnight. And uh, I think there's a mix of emotions. Some kids are really excited. Some are a little bit nervous. And what I'd love to do is just spend a moment praying, uh, thanking God for what he did this week and praying for our middle school students. And so would you buy your heads and let's pray together. Uh, Father, I, um, yeah, God, I think back to this last week and it was just so much fun to be here, so much fun to see your kids singing and opening your word and uh, just running around the building. And so, God, I'm so grateful um, for all of our volunteers who just invested their time to serve our kids so well. And God, I pray for kids, for the, the friendships they started to build. I pray that they would continue to grow. God, I pray that you would continue to help them to have a love for your church and most of all for you. God, would you continue to grow a strong faith, a deep faith in our kids. And God, we pray for our middle school students. Would you continue to keep them safe on their travel? Uh, God, would you help them to be healthy? Uh, God, we pray for those that are maybe a little bit nervous, um, not sure what to expect. God, I pray that you would meet them. Uh, would they make great friends? Uh, God, would they feel so loved and cared for? And God, I just pray for all of our students. Would you just meet them? Uh, God, would this be so transformational for their faith? Would they experience you in just a new way and uh, really sense you speaking to them? And, and God, would you just bless their experience and be with our leaders as well? Um, 
God, would you just give them just a supernatural sense of what our students need and how to care for them, how to shepherd them, what questions to ask, uh, be with our leaders too, and give them lots of energy as well. And again, just so grateful, God, for what you're doing in our kids and our students. We pray you'd continue to move, God, and uh, uh, God, we're just so grateful that we get to watch and be a part of it. And so, God, would you bless them? And God, would you continue to bless us as we continue in our service? Speak to us, give us ears to hear from you, hearts that are open to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in each of our services, we also like to give you some time to get to know each other or grab a cup of coffee. And so I'd love for you in just a moment to stand up, look for someone you don't know, and maybe share things that you like to do for fun in the summer. Maybe you had a summer camp that you went to. Maybe you had a family vacation. But I'd like to give you a few moments to do that so you can stand to your feet, meet some people, or if you prefer, go get some coffee and donuts. Then we'll come back together in a few minutes. In a few minutes, Steve is going to be up to teach us, I think, I hope, eventually, when everyone, you know, finishes yeah. their conversations. But before Steve comes up, we have one of our interns with us to read scripture this morning. This is Peter. Will you all say hi to Peter and welcome him up this morning? All right, Peter, uh, before we dive into the scripture this morning, uh, yeah. love to hear a little bit about you. Like, where'd you grow up? Where do you live? Um, so I was, so I originally grew up on the north side of the city by Wrigley Field, but about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got to focus some Cubs fans, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for about the past 13 years almost, I've lived around here, so it's a... <laughs> yes. It's kind of like a 25-75. So, okay, you um, got it. Great. And, uh, That's awesome. And uh, you're interning with us this summer. Now, what area are you focused on? I'm interning with the technical department. Oh, excellent. And how do you like that? I love it. It's very fun. Okay, good. Excellent. And uh, do you have any hobbies or things you like to do for fun? When I'm not here or working, I like to... I like to build model airplanes and exercise. Excellent. Build model airplanes. Is, this, is that like really hard to do? Like how long does it take to build one? Uh, the longest one of them took me was about almost two months. But wow. people on like YouTube make it look like it only takes like, like an hour. <laughs> um, it's fun though. It's, it's really relaxing. That's awesome. I love it. All right, Peter, will you go ahead and read our scripture for this morning? Yeah, definitely. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Can we thank Peter and welcome up Steve? Great job. Hey, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so good to be with you. Welcome those of you watching online as well. And if you're new, we're glad you're here. We hope you're having a great experience. Hope you feel at home. We've been studying uh, the most famous sermon of all time, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this summer, we've been going through it just chapter by chapter, verse by verse, to really try to understand what was Jesus saying and trying to apply it to our lives. And we're coming towards the end, and after instruction pieces that Jesus was giving, he, he, changes, he, he changes his tone, and he shifts and tells a parable. And if, if, you, if you haven't gone to church, you don't know, parables basically a story out of life, a made-up story, but it has moral and spiritual implications, and, and Jesus tells this story, and he basically tells the story that there, there's two guys, uh, two people, and, and they've got three things in common, and one thing that's very different that makes all the difference. And the core of it, he's inviting his audience back in that day, 2,000 years ago, to identify which of the two are you. And basically, he's going to end up saying, you are empowered to make a choice of which you'll be, which of these two individuals you'll be. The truth is, he, he's such a master storyteller and preacher that he's speaking to them, and, and he's speaking about them. And here it is 2,000 years later. I think as we talk about this, you'll see you have a lot in common with these two people. And you as well will make a choice which of these two you'll be like. 
He starts off, he says, there's these two people, three things in common. First thing, both of them are building a house. Raise your hands. How many of you have built a house before? Not necessarily with your hands, but you were in, raise your hands high so we can see. How many of you have led some kind of construction effort at some point so you get construction? Yeah. Jesus loves to take practical things that you and I've done and give it spiritual implications. They're both building the house. Now, the house in scripture is an analogy and a couple different things it means. One is it's, it's a life. It, Jesus is saying there's these two people. They have life ambitions. They, they've got goals for their lives. They, they want to accomplish different things for their career or for their education or financially. Maybe they want to get a college degree and after the degree they want to get a great job. And after they get the job, they go, I'd like to be an executive or maybe start my own business. They have dreams. You do too, don't you? Just like you, you've got dreams and ambitions, ideas. Where do you want to go? What do you want life to be like? What do you hope your life will become in your career, in your finances, right? They had dreams, and the house definitely encompasses that dream, but it's more than that. Because in Scripture, especially the Old Testament, the Scriptures that Jesus read, one of the meanings behind a house uh, was also a family. You think about David, David the king of David of Israel. When it talked about his family, they called it the house of David. And so the house also could mean your family. Some of you, you had dreams and ambitions to get married. And what would your marriage be like? And maybe you thought kids, we want to have a number of kids. One of the things I hear young couples talk about is how many kids you want to have? I want one, I want seven. Okay, we'll, we'll end on five, but we end up with seven anyway, right? Because whoever had the seven kind of makes the decision sometimes, right? Anybody else have that story? No, no, just me, no. But the, uh, the point is that you have these ambitions, not beyond just that. You have ambitions of not just how many kids, but what's your family going to be like? I'll tell you mine. So uh, mine, I grew up and I knew at a pretty young age I was going to be a pastor. And two of my friends were pastor's kids. One had a really fantastic dad. And one had a dad who, uh, you know, I think chose some things that I probably wouldn't. One grew up loving God, loving the church, loving his dad. The other one, uh, quite rebellious. You've probably heard stories of pastor kids. Uh, I watched the two and I thought, boy, when I get up three goals, I hope when my kids are adults, they love me. I hope when they're adults, they love God. I hope when they're adults, uh, they love the church. And now I can't control my kids. That's their choice. What the core of the goal is that I don't screw this up. Does that make sense? That I don't do something that puts them on the path that I watched my one friend where it just after watching his dad, he goes, I'm, I'm not going to choose. Does this, does this make sense? That's some of the goals we have, Right that our kids are well, that they're healthy, maybe that they're successful, maybe that they go to college or not, maybe you have those kinds of goals. These two did. Career goals, life ambitions, family goals, family, marriage ambitions. What will marriage be like? There's one third piece to this idea of the house, and it's this. It also encompasses a faith community. Again, the Hebrew scriptures that Jesus understood tells the story of God's interactions with the Jewish people. And one of the key aspects of it from the Exodus on is God decides that he will dwell amongst them and they build a house for him. In the Exodus, they built a tabernacle, a giant tent, put right in the center of the whole city. And, and that's where God dwelled and they celebrated. God dwelled amongst them. It was a house of God. Later, they would build a temple in Jerusalem. And the temple was the house of God. So... Even to this day, we still talk about this being a house of faith or the house of God. So it, not only was the house that these two characters were building about their personal ambition, their family ambition, but it moved even into the community of faith. Maybe you're the same way, that you have an ambition for a church in your life in our day, that, that you're part of a great church, that you're part of a welcoming church, that, that you're part of a church where you have a contribution, that you can be a leader or a servant or, or have a ministry that you can be part of. Maybe it's an ambition that your church has a good reputation in the community, so you're not afraid to say what church, you're maybe even proud to say what church you go to. Maybe it's that your church impacts the world, that they're alleviating hunger, some of the great needs. But many of us have an ambition for a faith community, and so did these two guys. They had dreams for themselves, dreams for their family, dreams for their faith community. And Jesus uses that analogy of a house, that's what they're building. They're building a house, building a life, building a family building a community of faith. That's one of the things they have in common. I think they may have that in common with you. Second thing, they both were listening to Jesus' teachings. They both got up early that day, heard Jesus, some uh, you know, itinerant rabbi was coming to town. They had heard stories of what a great teacher and miracle work he was, so they cleared the calendar. 
They got up early, they showered, they got dressed up, they showed up at church, they got the kids ready, kind of like you guys did today. They may have been a couple minutes late, it's okay, they got in for the sermon, that's the important part, right? (laughs) Sorry, Nisha. (laughs) They sat and listened, and they marveled. Bible tells us that the, the sermon that day, the preacher and both the words he preached we're like none other. It captures, it says this, that when Jesus finished this sermon we're studying, when Jesus finished saying the things, the crowds amazed, were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. They, in a crowd similar to this, sat and listened to a great sermon by a great preacher, the greatest ever walked this planet. And we, for the last two months, have been studying that same sermon. You are connected to them, the, 2,000 years later, still hearing and listening and studying the words preached that day. You have that in common with them. You've got life ambitions. You're also sitting and listening to Jesus' words. Sitting and listening. They have these two things in common and then a third thing. And the third thing would have been a surprise to them. Jesus says that coming in their future is a storm. 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 They're building a house, but what they don't realize is a great storm's coming. In the Bible, the storm represents trials, tribulations, difficulties. It represents financial struggles, job loss, health crises, relationship breakdown, a breakdown between families, kids. It represents all those things, storms. And one of the things about life is frequently when storms hit, it's not just one storm. Many times it's many storms all at the same time. We have a phrase for this in our culture. It says, when it rains, it... Yeah, the idea being like it's not a gentle rain. Some of the times it's a really tough, tough storm. And oftentimes in life, it isn't just a little rain that hits, but it's a hurricane or a typhoon or a tsunami. And one of the great misperceptions of Christians especially younger Christians, is the belief that if I become a Christian, then surely God is going to protect me from the storm, right? The reason I know this is true amongst young Christians is because I had this. I had this belief that, I, again, committed my life to Christ. I'm even going to be a professional, right? Surely God would make my life a little easier, don't you think? 25 years old, been in mystery just five years. 25 years old, my wife gets cancer. Within a, a weeks, the staff, I was part of a church about this size, about 700 people. We had uh, eight or nine staff. The entire staff left within a few months because there was a sin issue amongst leadership. So I was the only staff member. Then my wife's parents both uh, get laid off. I mean, it all happened within a few months. And I, and I was so mad at God because I was like, why are you doing this to me? I thought it would have an easy life. And and I realized that my theology was wrong. Jesus even warned it in this parable, the storms are coming. But he said it even more in John 16. He goes, in this world, you will have, what's the word? Trouble. Jesus doesn't lie. He goes, in this world, you're going to have trouble. And the storm he describes that will hit these two men building the house, he describes that the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and it beat against his house. Meaning, the rains came, but they didn't stop. The stream rise, I mean, it's flooding now. You can see the water rising up against the house. And then it's not just that, but there's this massive wind pushing against the house too. It, it is a storm. Jesus wants to say to every person, again, being a kind, good shepherd, that your life is going to have difficulties. And some of the times it doesn't just come in one, twos, three. Sometimes it's many things all at the same time. Your life will be difficult at times. You'll face the storm. I've been praying for you. I was thinking about this. Studying this, it's a nice parable, but I go, some of you, you're in the storm now. Mental health crisis, physical health, financial, jobs, marital. I've been praying for you because I thought the last thing I want is for this sermon and this topic to, to do anything but care for you. Does that make sense? But that's the truth. Jesus cared about his followers so much. He goes, I don't want to lie to you. There's going to be storms. And his point is, prepare for the storm. As you're building your house, make sure it's storm-proof. Make sure it will stand the test, right? Those are the three things they have in common. The difference is described within the parable. There's one thing they're very different on. 
And the parable describes that the two start to build their house. And it's almost, you can imagine them building right next door to each other. And one gets out the shovel and all the other things, and he starts digging away the dirt. Must have been so hard building a house manual labor 2,000 years ago, right? But he's got to excavate it on his own. And this is heavy labor. It's exhausting. It's in the hot sun. It is painful work. And as he's digging, trying to go down to find something stable, he looks next door. The other house is already going up. It's like, did that guy just start on solid ground? He's going up building the walls, and he's putting in the windows, and this guy's still digging, trying to find the foundation. At some point, I have to imagine he had to look at am I the fool? Like, this guy, this guy seems to be doing just fine. One house is finished as the other one finally hits rock bottom, and he starts to build. And after the time period when they're both done, the two houses look identical, just the same. But one took so much longer and so much more work and so much more labor, right? And weeks pass, and they look just the same. Years maybe even pass, look just the same. And I have to wonder, the guy that dug down to the rock was thinking, am I the fool? Did I, was it worth it? I thought this is the way you're supposed to do it, right? But then the rain starts. Then the flood waters rise. Then the wind starts to blow. And he looks over, and the house that got built fast, you can see it's starting to kind of wobble. And then it's starting to shake. And then it's starting to lean even. Then it starts to move forward. And the Bible describes, Jesus says this, at one point, the house falls with a great crash. Luke, which has a a parallel sermon, says the destruction of that man's house was complete. Translation. All his dreams for career, for family, for faith in the faith community, they're, they're falling apart. They're, they're shaky. It's not standing. The other one who took all the time, the exact same storms hitting it, and how's it described? Jesus says, that house did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. Luke says, the torrent struck the house but couldn't shake it because it was well bit. Isn't that good? Ah. Oh. One storm crushes the house. The other storm hits and the house is unshakable. And you have to ask, Jesus, what's the difference? Because none of us want a life that falls apart. All of us want our dreams to be strong and steadfast. All of us want our faith communities to get through difficulty. All of us want our families, knowing what we're going to face, we want to be able to get through this. What's the difference? What's the foundation? Here's what Jesus says. Everyone... Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine, but that's not enough, and puts them to practice, who hears and then does. One of the things you'll see in the New Testament is this common phrase they'll say is, listen and obey, hear and obey, listen and do what Jesus says. Now, we have the phrase hear and obey, but the Greek, which is the original language of the Bible, has a little something different. It's got a phrase. I'm going to teach it to you. It's a kuwe. Can you say a kuwe? A kuwe means to hear. A kuwe means to hear. A kuwe, that's right. Beth. But to obey is actually the word hooper kuwe. It's hyperlisten. To hear is just a kuwe, but to actually obey is to hyper-listen. L- let me make this analogy from our lives. Maybe you've experienced this. Moms and wives, maybe you, I'm going to guess you've experienced this. This is from my life when I'm about 26 years old, okay? I'm confessing this to you. Don't hold this against me, deal? You guys laugh, you know. So, back then, again, no kids. My wife was a nurse. She would work the 3 to 11 shift all these nights, and so I would play video games with my buddies. We'd gather at the house, you'd link up a bunch of Xboxes, this is before you could do it online, and we were all sitting there playing Halo or something, right? And we were dialed in, and about 11.30, my wife would come in from work, but I'm in the midst of the fight, right? And my wife would say something to me, something like, hey, we're out of milk, can you buy that tomorrow? And I would say, yes, dear, without looking up from the screen. Fast forward 24 hours later, my wife would come home and go, hey, where's the milk? And I'm like, hey, what are you talking about? And she goes, I asked you last night. 
And I said, I don't even remember you coming home last night. She goes, you said you'd do this. I had no memory of the conversation. Why? Because I was a kue. I, I listened, I responded, but my attention was somewhere else. Jesus is saying, some of you in a crowd, even to this day, you're listening, but it's kind of like that. Your mind is not fully invested. A kui. A few months later, I had an example of hyper akui. And this is when my wife came home. I was playing video games. She said, hey, I went to the doctor today to get a pregnancy test. And I hit pause and I said, you what? <laughs> you what? That word, I was like, oh, I got to pay attention, right? Some of you have had this experience. Your son, who's a teenager, borrowed your BMW and took it on a date. And then he came home and said, dad, I got some bad news. And you went, whoa, whoa. How's my car? Hyper Akui, right? Jesus is saying it's not just enough to kind of listen with just a little bit of engagement. He's looking for Hyper Akui. The difference between these two men, the difference between these two houses, is one of them is paying immense attention. It's going, this isn't just entertainment. I'm not just seeing to, you know, I got up to hear a great sermon and I go back to my life. Oh no, if this is God Himself, He has wisdom to offer me. I'm Hyper Akui. I'm listening with great intent with the hope to learn something that applies to my life. And can I tell you, my experience being a Christian now for 40 years, Jesus' teachings apply to all these practical areas of your life. He has something to say about your life goals and your dreams, your job. There is practical application from his teachings how to be a great employee or a great manager or a great leader. He's got awesome advice on what it means to be a, a parent on what it means to be a spouse. Awesome advice. Amazing advice on how to build a loving faith community, the kind of church you're looking for. It's all practically there. You gotta dig in. You gotta open up the word and study it. You gotta Google sometimes the problem you got. Did Jesus ever say anything about that? Because what I've found is so many areas in my life that I don't think the Bible would apply, it has something to apply. Let me give you an example. Some of you know years ago, I helped build a church right up the street. Big church. Some of you know the story that we had this awesome vision and we had a great fundraiser, but then we got the bids back on how much it would cost and it was way over budget. Millions over budget. Five million dollars over budget. And one group of my advisors said, the longer you wait to build, the higher the costs are gonna go, so just get building. One other advisor said, did Jesus have anything to say about a problem like this? And he did. He said a man set out to build a tower and started building, but he didn't have enough money, so he stopped halfway. And the town called him a fool. So we didn't start building. We waited till the budget got in order. Why? Because Jesus had great advice. I'm so glad we did. We cut six million from that budget. And it worked. Same building. Fast forward, we've gone through all this stuff. I get a call one day from our general contractor, and he said, Steve, I've got bad news. I immediately, again, hyper coup, bad news. Is everyone okay? Yes, Steve, everyone's all right. He said, Steve, we're, you know, we're about to start construction. We're digging some boreholes to see the nature of the ground, and there's a whole section that's bad dirt. I said, well, what do we have to do? He said, we've got to dig it all up. It's going to take some time, and it's going to cost more money. We have to dig all that up. We have to spread it out. We've got to pray for a week or two weeks with no rain and good sun so it dries it out. Then we'll have to recompact it more time and money. Then we can start. I said, are you sure we need to do this? And he said, Reverend, did Jesus say anything about building a house on sand? <laughs> Practical, right? So we waited. We did this. I said, yeah. Jesus actually had something to say about that. Marriage. Again, reading scripture and then having friends, trusted friends that you're doing life with and talking about your faith with. One of my friends, another pastor, and we would talk about the struggles we had. We would talk about marriage. He came to me one day, he said, Steve, there's this verse that I, I have a problem. He said, Jesus said this phrase. He said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He goes, here's my problem. I think this whole time I've been loving the church the way Christ loved the church and I haven't been loving my wife well. And I went, oh, I think that's true for me too. 
So we both just said, what are we going to do? Let's share ideas. Let's get creative. How do we shift this? How do we course correct? Because we're, we're failing. Jesus is saying, your foundation's bad. It's a fool who puts all his efforts into building a church, but the marriage falls apart, right? So we just encourage each other. And neither of us are perfect. We would all tell you that. But it's better because we've read scripture. We listened to the Holy Spirit. We had a friendship where we could encourage each other. Friends, this is what Jesus is saying. The foundation he's talking about will give you life to get through the storms. But you got to do it. You have to do something with it. And if you don't, I'm not going to mince words, he calls you a fool. Because you know all the right answers, you'd get 100% on the test, you just never applied it. Never applied it. Jesus said it this way at the end of the Luke sermon of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Lord, Lord, the idea is these were people who committed their lives to him, who believed he was who he said he was. God himself left heaven to teach them. He's like, you're calling me Lord, Lord, you just don't do anything. Why not? He said that to his audience 2,000 years ago. Translation, he's saying that to you today, especially those of you who are Christians. He goes, why do you call me Lord? But, but you're not actually reading this. You're not actually applying it. You're not actually trying He's warning you, your foundation's not going to make it through the storm. The beautiful thing, and this is where this teaching's a little different than real life is, once you've built the house to fix the foundation, if you've ever had to do it incredibly costly, very difficult. The beautiful thing is once you've built this faith house, you can redo it. You can. You can fix it. But it's going to take time and effort and intentionality. Friends, this is my invitation to you. I've just got to speak to you. Some of you, this is the great chance to do a quick foundation test. Will it stand up in the storm? And do you need to do some fixing? My hope is this, that you, some of you go, man, I've stopped reading the Bible. I'm going to dive back in. Start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Pick one. Go through it. Read it. Take practical examples. Some of you, as you face problems in life, don't just try to figure it out on your own. Even as simple as just Google, did Jesus have anything to say about this problem? And then take it. Does the Bible have anything to say about this? And then listen to it, study it, try to apply it. But his hope, and my hope too, is at the end of your life, you're counted amongst one of the wise ones who took the time to dig deep, who took the time to understand his words, who took the time to apply them to your life as best you could so that you get it through the storm. Don't you agree? Yeah. Now, I want to end our service a little different. I don't know if we've done this as a church here. What I want to do is I want to end with a time of prayer, but I'm going to invite those of you who would like to kind of just indicate physically that you want to change something. I'll ask you to stand, no one looking around. I'm not either. And here it is. Some of you have been listening to this and you go, I've never committed my life to Christ. Some of you, you, you go, I'm sitting in church, but I'm not a Christian. Bible describes you're not born as a Christian, you choose it. That every person makes a choice. You either believe Jesus was who he said he was, or you don't. And if you do, you then, the Bible just describes you declare it, and then you receive grace. The Bible describes in that moment, there's an adoption that takes place. You become a beloved child of the Most High God, and he grants his Holy Spirit to you. And it's all done, Romans says, just through a simple prayer. All who call on the name of the Lord, it says, will be saved. And so if this is you, you go, I have never done it, but I want to declare it today. You just stand up, and where you're standing, you, you just say a prayer. God, I believe in you, and I receive grace today. You can do that. That's the first group. Second group, you, you might believe in him, but you go, I, I call him Lord, Lord, but the foundation's bad. I haven't done the hard work, and I'm committing myself to do that. And you just stand up, and your prayer is a simple one. You're like, I'm done with a house built on sand, I'm committing myself to the foundation work to build on the rock. And you just stand up. Third group is those of you who go, I'm in the midst of the storm. Health crisis, financial crisis, relationship breakdown, whatever the storm is. And you just stand. Again, none of us are looking around. It's simply a way for you to stand in front of heaven and go, would you see me? I'm making a choice today. Sound good? So would you all just bow your heads? Me too. And if this is one of you, any of those three groups, would you just stand up? If you go, I want to declare your faith, you stand up. If you go, I want to make a change and go, the foundation is in a stable, I'm committing myself to build on the rock, you stand up. 
If you go, I'm in the midst of the storm, I could use prayer. Would you stand up? God, none of us are looking around, but you see each person. God, I hope right now in this moment they know you see them, you honor them. God, you know their heart, you know exactly what they need. God, what I ask is you be so close to them, your Holy Spirit would be moving in them. God, for those who are declaring faith today, I ask this, you seal that decision. God, you start them on the process of building a firm foundation on you and you alone. You lead them forward, guide them to a great group and friends. And God, would you guide them into scripture ways to grow in their faith? But God, might they know on this day, that this day, you sealed this decision, saved them forever, adopted them into this family. God, those who are Christians, but they go, oh, I think the foundation is on sandy ground. God, I'd ask you, guide them into scripture, and would you reveal yourself to them? God, would you show up tangibly and practically for the issues they have? God, might they do the hard work to build friendships that are meaningful and, and, and deep and scripture-centered, trying to help each other grow? And God, my hope is when the storm comes and they get through it, they look back and they go, oh, Jesus was true to his word. You build on him and you get through the storm because he's the rock. Finally, God, the ones who are in the storm. You know, God, there's another story in the Bible of a day where you took your disciples out in a boat and a huge storm hit. And, and they were frightened. And, and you were asleep. And, and you asked them, basically, why are you so afraid? <laughs> I imagine they just looked at you like you were nuts. And then you calmed the storm. God, I'd ask, would you calm the storm and the ones who are standing? God, for those who have health issues, would you heal them either through the medical or the miraculous? God, we'll give you credit either way. God, for those with financial issues, would you provide for them, God, in a way they could only say it came from your hand? Would you be the good father? God, those who have a job crisis, would you provide a great job, great wisdom? God, those who have mental health issues in their family, God, would you guide them to good treatments and care and healing? God, those who have relationship breaking on in their marriage or with their kids, would you restore them? God, that's my prayer. And God, might our church be a place fully devoted to you, built on the rock, that we always look to scripture to teach us and educate us, that we humble ourselves and try to serve the world out of all the ways you've served us, but that God, you would forever be this church's rock. That's our prayer. We prayed this now in the name of Christ and everyone agreed and said, Amen, amen, amen. You can go ahead and grab your seats. It's good to be with you today. Uh, and we have one last piece in this announcement. Just so you know, so I'm a bit under the weather, so I'm gonna sneak out just because I don't want to get any of you sick. Gene will be down front. Jason will be here if you have anything. But Jason, why don't you come up and we can close this service uh, with announcements, yeah. Okay, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. We've got a couple of things I want to let you know about that are coming up. Uh, we have a fun couple of weeks ahead of us. Uh, next Sunday is going to be our annual church picnic over at Flick Park. And so you're welcome to come on out. Uh, you can bring friends with you if you'd like. We'll have food, games, just a chance to hang out as a community and enjoy some time outside. Uh, we could use some help with food. And so you'll see if you do register uh, according to the first letter of your last name, uh, if you're willing, maybe bring a dessert or a side or some chips to just kind of help out with that. Uh, you, it would help us, too, if you register, just so we have an idea of how much of the food we're purchasing uh, to purchase. But, yeah, it should be a great time, so I hope you can join us for that. The following Sunday, August 11th, we're going to have our baptism service here at the church, and we've been talking about this for the last uh, few weeks. And I just want to encourage you again that if you uh, sense at all that God is prompting you to take this step, uh, to not ignore that prompting. If you are a follower of Christ... If you set, uh, trusted in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, then really that first step he asks us to take is to identify with him through the act of baptism, to proclaim that uh, publicly through that act. And so, uh, yeah, if you sense that prompt at all, please talk to somebody. Uh, we'd be happy to talk with you. Maybe you have a, a friend or family member that's a believer that you'd uh, be more comfortable talking to. But I would say whenever God stirs and prompts you, don't ignore that. Uh, pray about it, seek some counsel, and if we can help with that, uh, we'd be happy to do that. So you can register for that on our events page uh, on our website or by using the QR code. Uh, and again, we'd be happy to talk to you more about it down front here today. Uh, last thing I have is today we're actually offering a really quick opportunity for uh, everybody to do a service project together. Uh, we mentioned this last week that we're partnering with the Salvation Army to pack uh, these little snack packs. 
that will go to first responders in the city uh, throughout this summer. It's going to be a very busy summer for uh, our first responders here in Chicago. And so one way we just want to let them know that we're thinking about them and care about them is by helping to provide some snack packs for them. And so today at uh, 1215, uh, we're going to invite you to come basically right when the service ends to walk over to our student chapel. If you walk out these front doors, just hang a left and keep going. Go down the stairs and enter the back of the building. Uh, And what we're going to do is pack these kind of assembly line style. So there'll be two tables end to end. We'll have about 20 people at each table. They'll open a bag at one end, and then each person is dropping a a little goodie into these bags. They wrap them up, put them in the box at the end of that row. Once we fill the box, we put the boxes on a pallet, and uh, Tuesday they'll come and pick it up. And we've committed to packing over 5,000 of these packs. The good news is our 9 o'clock service just killed it. They've already packed... uh, close to 50% of what we need, and uh, I feel confident that this group could finish the job. So uh, are you guys up for it? All right, so we have, uh, there's probably about 150 spots for people to jump into and serve over there. Uh, I feel like we could probably do that. So uh, kids ages five and up can join you. So if you want to grab your kids and bring them on over, should be a real fun way to serve together. Probably going to take just about 25, 30 minutes, uh, and uh, yeah, and then we'll be done. Good? All right, so if you came prepared to give an offering today, you can do that on your way out. There's a giving box uh, by the back door. We'll either see you next door at the serving opportunity or see you back next week. Take care.